It was June 30th, 1908, in a remote part of Siberia. For the indigenous reindeer herders, it was a normal morning, until it wasn't. My spali, we were sleeping. Suddenly, we both woke up at the same time. Somebody or something shoved us. We heard whistling and felt strong wind. Chikarin said, Can you hear all those birds flying overhead? We were both in the hut, couldn't see what was going on outside. Suddenly, I got shoved again. This time so hard I fell into the fire. I got scared. We started crying out for father, mother, brother, but no one answered. There was noise beyond the hut. Chikarin and I got out of our sleeping bags and wanted to run out, but then the thunder struck. This was the first thunder. The earth began to move and rock. Wind hit our hut and knocked it over. My body was pushed down by sticks, but my head was in the clear. Then I saw a wonder. Trees were falling. The branches were on fire. It became mighty bright. How can I say this? As if there was a second sun. My eyes were hurting. I even had to close them. And immediately there was another loud thunder. This was the second thunder. The morning was sunny. There were no clouds. Our sun was shining brightly as usual. And suddenly there came a second one. Jakarin and I had some difficulty getting out from under the remains of our hut. Then we saw that above, but in a different place. There was another flash, and loud thunder came. This was the third thunder strike. Wind came again, knocked us off our feet, struck against the fallen trees. We looked at the fallen trees, watched the treetops get snapped off, watched the fires. Suddenly, Chikarin yelled, Look up! and pointed with his hand. I looked there and saw another flash, and it made another thunder, but the noise was less than before. This was the fourth strike, like normal thunder. What you just listened to was a first-hand account of the largest natural blast ever recorded, and they were a full 25 miles from ground zero. The blast was about 15 megatons, a thousand times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima 37 years beforehand. In modern times, this would be front page news everywhere. The thing was, this was 1908, in the middle of absolute nowhere Siberia. Only about three people died from the blast that affected 830 square miles and flattened 80 million trees, but strangely left the trees near the blast stripped but still standing like an eerie telephone pole graveyard. Something was off about this though. There was no crater, no direct impact area, no meteor fragments found and multiple thunderous blasts were heard varying from four to 50 times depending on the eyewitness accounts. And people all across Europe and Asia witnessed skies so bright in the days that followed that they were able to read newspapers outdoors at midnight. What caused this? Depending on who you ask, you may get a different answer. A paper in the journal Nature was published claiming that it was a miniature black hole only as big as a single atom. At 717, it punches into the Earth's atmosphere. Air compresses to plasma, and the entry shock registers as the Tunguska blast. Fractions of a second later, it goes straight through Earth, then exits out the other side in the North Atlantic and is gone. A black hole would leave no fragments behind, but an entry-exit pair could cause the cannon-like booms people heard over and over. It also pierces the Earth, leaving no crater. Another paper in the esteemed journal Nature claimed it to be antimatter annihilation. Imagine a basketball-sized nugget of antimatter, just one pound, wandering through the Milky Way for millennia. If antimatter and matter come in contact in any way, they instantly annihilate each other, releasing almost all energy contained within that matter, way more than any similarly sized nuclear bomb could ever release. This is precisely what eyewitnesses describe. Searing light, a heat pulse, a shock wave, yet no debris. Physicists Clyde Cowan and Nobel laureate Willard Libby ran the numbers in 1965. This explosion to spike global radiocarbon levels, exactly what tree ring archives seem to show for 1909. The glowing skies we mentioned earlier is what would happen from high altitude ionization from a, the annihilation plume. But fans of Nikola Tesla offer the craziest explanation. He was attempting to prove his invention can be limitless power. Tesla said to reporters just a couple months earlier, Wireless power plants could be constructed by which any region of the globe might be rendered uninhabitable. 
At the time, he was trying to secure funding. Was he doing reckless experiments that sent a beam across the globe? Instead of a polar light show, the beam focused in central Siberia instead. Magnetometers, sensors that detect magnetic fields, registered sudden geomagnetic oscillations during the blast. Phenomena a massive electromagnetic pulse would create, but a lone meteor might not. There was a unique combination of factors that resulted in zero new evidence in this mystery for a long time. It happened in the middle of nowhere. Russia was in turmoil. Assassinations, World War I, Civil War, World War II. All of these things made it very difficult to study what happened at all. It wasn't until 1921 that Leonid Kulik made the first attempt to figure this all out, but this failed due to inaccurate maps of the vast landscape. After six more years of persuasion, he finally got the funding and men for a full-scale exposition to ground zero. He finally made it, 19 years later. Even after all these years, the devastation was still unimaginable. Near the epicenter was what people described as telephone poles, tree trunks stripped of everything that are still standing. But Kulik thought he was going to find a massive crater. They drained multiple bogs of water, but every single one was natural to the area. They dug for meteor fragments and none were found. The first real clue was finding tiny silicate spheres and metal particles in the area, but nothing conclusive. Kulik went into this with the theory that this was an iron meteorite, so his lack of evidence was extremely frustrating. All he had was some dust, but Kulik wasn't one to give up. He returned time and time again throughout the 1930s, meticulously interviewing witnesses. Their stories started to paint a consistent picture of something exploding above the forest. He noted how those telephone pole trees were scorched from above, not by a ground fire spreading sideways. And the way the millions of other trees lay, radiating outwards, it all screamed airburst. Kulik theorized it might have been a meteorite rain, a fragile object that shattered high up, its pieces too small to make a big crater. He even tried draining more bogs, always hoping for that elusive big fragment, but only ever finding preserved tree stumps, mocking his search for a crater. But World War II intervened, and tragically, Kulik died a prisoner of war in 1942. The Tunguska mystery went cold again. But his work didn't go to waste. Those tiny particles and detailed observations were dug up a couple decades later. In the 50s and 60s, Soviet science, now in a new era, picked up the trail. Teams of scientists, geologists, chemists, and physicists returned once again to that remote Siberian site. They had new tools and new techniques. They re-examined Kulik's samples and collected their own, layer by painstaking layer from the peat bogs, which act like natural archives, trapping evidence from the sky preserved year by year. They found more of those tiny glassy spheres embedded in tree resin from surviving conifers in growth rings dated precisely to 1908. Analysis showed this wasn't just any dust. It contained nickel, iron, and iridium, a chemical fingerprint pointing strongly towards an extraterrestrial visitor. Some even contained Lonsdaleite, a super hard form of a diamond that only forms under the colossal shock and pressure of a cosmic impact. It was confirmed. This came from space. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on the way you look at it, this thoroughly discredited the previous theories, all which relied on not finding any stuff at the impact site. They also mapped out the impact pattern with painstaking precision, the trees that were laying on their side away from the direction of ground zero. It wasn't perfectly circular. It was more like a giant butterfly, its wings stretching 45 miles, telling a story about the direction the object came from and the angle of its descent, roughly 30 degrees from the east-southeast. They even built miniature forests, scaled models with tiny trees, and set off explosives above them, meticulously studying the blast patterns. The evidence was mounting, piece by piece. No giant crater because the object never made it to the ground in one piece. No large fragments because it likely vaporized or shattered into those microscopic remnants. The picture that emerged was of a cosmic body, about 100 to 200 feet across. A stony asteroid, not an iron asteroid, being the prime suspect given the mineral evidence screaming into the Earth's atmosphere at something like 10 miles per second, heating to temperatures hotter than the sun's surface. 
If you ever hit water at speeds more than 30 miles an hour, you know that something normally soft can feel like concrete. At these speeds, hitting the Earth's atmosphere is like that, but multiplied a thousand X. Around three to six miles up, it collided and vaporized, creating the largest natural blast ever recorded. 